It is good to see you today, Destiny. Y'all glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. We are excited about doing the series on search for significance. Because to be honest with you, a lot of people are searching. We search for many different things, don't we? Yesterday I couldn't find my keys, so I was searching for my, key, my keys. I laid my wallet down somewhere. I couldn't find out where I did with it, so I was searching for that. And so many people are searching, but many people are searching in the wrong place. And more importantly, they're searching for their significance in the wrong place. So we're going to talk about searching for significance in this series we're doing today because we got to realize that uh, we need to start looking at ourselves not through the eyes of other people. We want to look at ourselves, number one, through the eyes that God has for us. We want to look at ourselves, uh, we want to view ourselves biblically. We want to view ourselves theologically. And we also want to view ourselves Christologically. In other words, how does Christ see us? And I will suggest to you today, he sees you differently than your mama does. He sees you differently than your daddy does. And he sees you differently than your friends on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. Because he sees you. Through the, God sees you through the life of Christ. So listen, your identity doesn't need to be in other people. Your identity needs to be in Christ. Amen. So we're going to talk about that. That, By the way, I was telling the young adults uh, on Friday, had to speak to them about purpose. And I told the importance of this thing called identity and finding your identity in the right place. And I told them this, I said that I like to go to Miami, Florida, and I like to go to South Beach. I mean, I just love South Beach. I love the beaches there. I love the sun. I love the hot weather. I just love going there. So when I work through my PhD, I have what we call a fall break. And every fall break, I'd go to South Beach. I put my little money together. And I'm not a, I'm a, I, I call myself a baller on a budget. <laughs> And so what I did, I couldn't fly into Miami International Airport. I had to fly into Fort Lauderdale Airport. I get to fly into Fort Lauderdale Airport. It's a cheaper flight I could get, and I could rent a car. Yeah. And within an hour, I could drive down Interstate 95, and I could find myself in South Beach. I love South Beach. And so I usually like, fly out of DFW. And you know how it is trying to navigate that maze at DFW. They, my friend dropped me off at the airport. I was excited to go to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, so I could be at South Beach. But then something happened. I got my baggage. I got my luggage. And I was on my way to go through the security, TSA. And you know, that could be problematic. So I got in line, and everything, you know, if you want to go to TSA, they want you to have, number one, your boarding pass. And number two, they want you to have out your identification. And so I was getting my boarding pass and my identification. I was waiting in line, but then I realized that I got closer to the, the man at the desk. I couldn't find my ID. I was worried. Because, see, if I can't find my ID, I can't get on this plane. And if I can't get on this plane, I can't go to Fort Lauderdale. And if I can't go to Fort Lauderdale, I can't rent a car. And if I can't rent a car, I can't go to South Beach. I got to find my ID. So I began to look everywhere for it. I looked in my baggage. I had a good bag there that was just a check on you. I'm flying American Airlines, and I ain't trying to pay no extra fees, so I carry on my stuff. So I had my bag, and I, maybe I said, maybe I placed it in there. I looked all throughout my baggage, couldn't find my ID. I said, not in my baggage. I started searching all over my body. Had a little, little jacket on, so I checked it all over my body, in my, all my pockets, all over my body. And you know what? I couldn't even find my ID on my body. And I was getting nervous. I said, what am I going to do? Maybe I left it in the car. Maybe. And here's the thing. I remember. He said, Lord told me, he said, Tim, you were studying your Bible a few minutes ago. 
He said, check in your Bible. And you know what I did? I opened up my Bible. And you know what my ID was? It was in my Bible the whole time. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. But see, you try to check your identification and you try to check in your baggage. I can't tell you, your ID ain't on your baggage. It ain't what your mama said or what your daddy said in your past, saying you ain't going to amount to nothing. It's not in your baggage. Watch this. It's even, not even on your body. I know I'm talking to somebody today. Because you think you got a good body, you work out. <laughs> you got a Coke bottle figure. You're going to realize in a couple of years it's going to be a milk jug. <laughs> So your identification ain't on your body. I know you're a he-man, but you got a she-weakness. Because it's not on your body. And so what we're going to talk about today is how important it is to have your identity in the right place. Because as you search for significance, the important thing is, it's not in your relationship, it's not in your resources, it's not in your recognition, but the reality is your identification and your significance is going to be found in the reconciliation of God. Hallelujah. Now, see, I can unpack that principally, but I want to unpack it personally. Because I got to be honest with you. Turn, if you're in your Bible today, to Genesis chapter 29. In your Bible today, on your phone, on your tablet, or on your, in your person, in your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 29. While you're turning there, I got a confession to make. While you're turning to Genesis 29, I got to tell you something. I'm an addict. I'm an addict, but the reality is, I'm an addict, but I've never been drunk. I'm an addict, but I've never smoked a joint, a blunt, I never popped any pills, but I'm an addict. I'm an addict, and I've never spent all the bill money or the mortgage money at the boat, <laughs> at Windstar, Choctaw, but I'm an addict. I've never been Narcotics Anonymous. I've never been at Alcoholics Anonymous. I've never been to support groups that can help me deal with my addiction, but I'm an addict. And you're looking at me funny because you probably want to know, what kind of addict is he? It's probably the same kind of addict many of you are. See, because my addiction is an addiction of approval. I want people to like me. I want people to approve of me. I want people to love me. I want people to, whatever I post on Facebook, to like it. Whatever I post on Instagram, I want them to give me a like. I'm an approval addict. And many of you here on today, may not have drank anything, may not have smoked anything, may not have popped any pills, may not have been in and out of sexual relationships, but the reality is you may be an addict. And you may be an addict today because you're addicted to approval. You believe the lie that said, if I'm approved by others, that gives me value. Maybe you're an addict today. Maybe you're an addict today because you are preoccupied with how others view you. Preoccupied with it. Maybe you're an addict today because you are focused on or consumed with how other people view you because you think that that's what gives you value. What other folks say about you. You're consumed with it. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that you will never find your approval 
and other people. But I want to talk about that not just with regard to principle. I want to talk about it with regard to a person. Because I believe that there's a person in the Bible that is where you are right now. Her name is Leah. And in Genesis chapter 29, we discover that this lady by the name of Leah is trying to get approval in wrong ways. Can I show that to you? If you want to read, if you read Genesis chapter 29 in your own private praying time, read Genesis chapter 28, 29, and 30, because that makes up the context of what we're going to be studying today. Because we're going to realize today that approval is not going to be in a person, in a relationship, is not going to be in your resources, what you can give, and it's not going to be based upon other people's recognition. Is going to be based upon the reconciliation of God and what God has done through Christ. Can I just show that to you? Amen. Because in Genesis chapter 29, we're introduced to a lady named Leah. Yeah. But I got to give you the, the back story. Because in this situation, the circumstance, there's a fellow by the name of Jacob. How many of you ever heard of a fellow by the name of Jacob? Raise your hand. A few of you. Jacob is the son of Isaac. Right, the grandson of Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 28, what Jacob does is he steals the blessing from his brother Esau. Y'all know what I'm talking about? He steals the blessing from his brother Esau. Isaac, poor, blind Isaac, is trying to bless his children. He blesses his son, and his blessing was supposed to go on Esau. But Jacob, with his tricky self, in cahoots with his mama, tricks Isaac and gets the blessing that was supposed to go to Esau, it comes to Jacob. Esau finds out about it. And Esau is hot as fish grease, y'all. He wants to do something to Jacob. And Jacob in Genesis chapter 20, 28, he actually ultimately ends up leaving. Jacob leaves, and he finds himself in this little country, and he finds out that he finds himself at a well. And when he finds himself at a well, a beautiful lady comes up, and Jacob sees her. Her name is Rachel, and she was beautiful. The text says, watch this, she was fine. <laughs> watch this. The text says is that she was beautiful, watch this, in form, and she's also beautiful in face. That's a New American Standard. In other words, y'all ain't look, got it. In other words, she is the perfect combination. Y'all ain't got it, man. Go old school. Uh, uh, uh. We used to call it, a, back in the day, a bad mama jamma. <laughs> because her body measurements were perfect in every dimension. <laughs> I mean, she had a figure that could show enough get attention. Matter of fact, she was poetry in motion. A beautiful sight to see. She was good in form, which means she's fine. But she's also beautiful in face. Isn't that interesting? He said, because some people, to be honest with you, either have one or the other. Some brothers got beautiful bodies. They work out, but they ain't looking all that good in the face. <laughs> I'm just keeping it real. So you ain't got to get no Harlequin romance. You ain't got to get Eric Jerome Dickey. You can read the Bible, and you can find a lot of stuff out. Watch this. She's beautiful in form and face, and it was love at first sight. So I got to marry this woman Even though Jacob is a little passive He got aggressive then And here's what happens She's coming along to feed the sheep And she, he finds her at this well But this well had a real big stone on top of it And Jacob, you know how it is, brothers You see a beautiful woman You want to try to impress her, don't you? Y'all ain't going to help me today? You see a beautiful woman that's fine And fitted and formed and 
fashioned in a certain way. He said, you want to impress her. And so Jacob wants to impress her. So what he did, that stone that was real heavy, with his bare hands, he lifts up the stone. So Rachel could get some water. That's a brother, ain't it? I'm going to talk about how this approval addiction ultimately so he lifts up the well, she gets the well, and, he, and she goes to Rachel's house and finds out that she has a, he has an uncle there by the name of Laban. Now Laban is, a, Jacob is a trickster, his name means heel grabber. He was sneaky, subtle, and slick. But he meets his match with Laban. Because even though Jacob is a trickster, Laban is the OG. Ralph West says he's an old, he's original gangster. He's an original trickster. And can I tell you, you, you can't out-trick a trickster. Ain't nothing, ain't nothing worse than an old trick. And that's what Label is. <laughs> Label is an old trickster. And he said, won't you do this, uh, uh, Jacob? He said, since we kinfolk, why don't you go ahead and stay with me and work for me? He said, if you work for me, I'll pay you whatever you ask. He said, by the way, what are your wages? Jacob said, now listen. He said, I don't want your dollar. What I want is your daughter. He said, I don't want your money. What I want is to get married. He said, okay, cool. None of the problem. I'd rather might as well just give it to you better than anybody else. He said, so what I do is I'll give uh, her to you. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to work for me seven years. Y'all read the Bible sometime when you get a chance. Yeah. Worked for me for seven years. He said, no problem. Jacob works for seven years for Laban. And the seven years is up. And the Bible says, even though the seven years was a long time, because he was so in love with Rachel, it seemed like only a few days. So the seven years was up. He said, Laban, he said, uh, it's time for me to get married. I've been holding myself for seven years. I'm like a caged animal. He said, no problem. He said, I'll give it to you. He said, but what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a party first. So they have a party. They, 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 they got the wine and the drinks, and they partying all night long, had a big wedding feast. And uh, uh, what somebody said, Jeremiah says that the problem with Jacob is probably a little wine and some darkness got him in trouble some drinks and some darkness got him in trouble can I show you how because here's what he did after the wedding ceremony it was time for him to give his have, it, have sex with his wife Laban with his old tricky self cahooted with Leah and said Leah I'm trying to get you married off now child what I want you to go in there and be with Jacob Jacob didn't know because it was dark and he had something to drink. And can I suggest something to you? You will get in trouble in darkness. Y'all ain't going to help me today. You'll get in trouble. You ever notice how folk don't do bad until it's dark? Huh? It's done in darkness. Wait a minute. It also can get you in trouble. Not only can darkness get you in trouble, drinking can get you in trouble. And so you know how he was? He's celebrating. He's probably got a little tipsy. Probably got a little drunk. And he slipped Leah in there. He, he has sex with Leah. And see, back then, it's dark. So how can that happen? He said, because it's dark back then. It's what you call country dark. Y'all know what country dark is? It ain't dark like it is in the city. Country dark, you can't, it gets so dark, you literally can't see the hand in front of your face. That's how dark it is. It's country dark. So he, he consummates the marriage with Leah. He wakes up the next morning, y'all, uh, baby, baby. And he finds out that it's Leah and not Rachel. He goes to Laban. He is mad, ready to tear up something. He's like, why you trick me and fool me like this? 
leg and say, calm down, man, calm down. He said, I don't know how you do it over in your neck of the woods. But in these parts, it's not customary to give the younger before you give the older. See, because it upsets the equilibrium of society. He said, you can't do that. So you got to marry the oldest one first. Jacob mad. He said, but I'll tell you what, Jacob. He said, I know you want Rachel. He said, I'm going to make a deal with you. Now, I don't do this for everybody. <laughs> but since you kinfolk, I'm going to do this for you. Now, listen, I'll give you Rachel, but you got to work for me seven more years. He gives Rachel to him. He works seven more years. And here's where the story picks up. Because he has sex with Leah even when he really doesn't love her. I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm talking to some single folk right now. That you think because they're having sex with you that they love you. Y'all ain't gonna help me this morning. Go watch this. Here's what Leah does. Let's pick it up in verse 31, Genesis chapter 29. It says, Now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened up her womb, but Rachel was barren. Right? Now remember that Leah had tender eyes. J Rachel was beautiful in form and in face. See, because here you got to understand, a lot of people that want approval or find their significance in relationships, you know what happens? It's always a comparison and competition. See, because if you're looking for approval from people, you look outside yourself and compare yourself with another person. Men compare themselves to other men on the job. Men compare themselves when they go on the golf course. Men compare themselves even at church. It's a comparison competition. That's why you get jealous when somebody gets a promotion and you don't because it's about a comparison. You get mad when somebody gets blessed and you don't because it's about a comparison. Leah, tender-eyed. Rachel, form and fitted. Who are you comparing yourself to today? And you think that that is the model and the standard to be approved. Comparison and competition. So here's the problem. When we end up comparing and competing, we often end up criticizing and complaining. Somebody need to put that on Facebook. When you compare and you compete, you end up criticizing and you end up complaining. See, here's the thing. In your search for significance, don't make substitutions for the Savior because you end up suffering in shame. Let me say that one more time. In your serious search for satisfaction, don't make substitutes for the Savior because you end up suffering in sorrow and you end up suffering in shame. Look what Leah does. Now, th even though this is Leah, this also applies to Lee. Even though Leah is a woman, it also applies to the man. Because here what Leah does, Leah has four children. And watch what she said at the end of every verse. She says this, Surely he'll love me now because I gave him a son. The first child he has is a guy by the name of Reuben. These are going to ultimately be the 12 tribes of Israel. He said, if I give him a child, if I give him a boy, surely he'll love me. So she does. She's trying to find her approval in her relationship. Men are the same way, aren't they? That's why we got to always name drop. I was having lunch with so-and-so yesterday. On the job. 
I was talking to so-and-so on the phone. What that is, is your, you are trying to find your significance in your relationships. You're not different than Leah. Look, she has Reuben. Gives him another baby. Right? Named Simeon. He says, surely he'll love me now because I gave him two sons. Jacob still didn't love him. And can I suggest something to you? She keeps having baby after baby after baby. Trying to get somebody to validate her need, number one, for affirmation. Wants to be a firm, and nothing wrong with that. But the reality is, is that if you keep wanting to get affirmed, you need more and more affirmation. Five likes is better than four likes. 500 likes is better than 100 likes. 1,000 likes is better. You know how it is in social media. It's a never-ending cycle for approval, for affirmation. So what you do is you, you try to get affirmed. Men try to get it in finances. Men try to get it with females. Just like Jacob. He threw that stone off like he was bad, bad Leroy Brown. <laughs> it was because he wanted her. See, all boys want to please mama, don't we? We want to please daddy, don't we? Daddy, look what I did. Affirmation. Mama! affirmation because we think affirmation and approval is connected with our relationship wait a minute we also believe that affirmation we also believe that approval is not only connected with our relationships we also think that approval is connected with our resources what we can give what we have so we look at our cash we look at our cars we look at our commodities we look at our Caribbean cruises our country home, and we think that somehow, some way, that's going to get our approval and that's going to make us significant. Leah's the same way. It's what she could give him. She gave him first child, no love. Second child, no love. Third child, Levi, she says this. She says, certainly he'll be attached to me. Attached? That's connection. Because we all want to be connected with somebody, don't we? We always look at how many friends we have, because that's connection. We look at how many followers we have, because that shows us that we're well connected. And can I tell you this? After Leah found out that she had a baby, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Jacob still. Wasn't attached. But then she has a fourth child. Listen, I'm almost done. Here's what she realizes. By the way, the name of my sermon is You Better Recognize. You better recognize that your approval is not in relationships, people in and out of relationships, because they're seeking approval. It's not in your resources, what you have, what you can give. Watch this. It's not in your recognition who approves you. You know what Rachel does? She finally has that fourth child. Fourth child is named Judah. And Judah means, I will praise the Lord. I will praise Jehovah. You know what's going on? Because here's the thing, she has reconciliation within herself. You say, you know what? I can't get it through resources. I can't get it through relationship. I can't get it through recognition. He said, I'm only going to get it in my right relationship and my reconciliation with God. I'm going to name him Judah. Because Judah means praise. She resolved to herself 
that she has to recognize that the only thing that's going to ultimately matter yeah. is not what Jacob says. Yeah. Yeah. What ultimately going to matter is not my comparison with Rachel. What's ultimately going to matter in my life is my relationship with God and how I praise him. So what's the, what's the remedy? Because it's more to this text than meets the eye because once you recognize that what Leah does is she has this final baby named Judah. And what the, the author of Genesis, Moses, wants you to do is I'm going to give you a foreshadowing of the ultimate remedy for your approval addiction. Yeah, yeah. Can I show it to you? Because what he's going to do is through the line of Judah yeah. Yeah. is going to come a fella, maybe you heard him before, his name is Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Because the spelling of this Hebrew word has an interesting character. One of the characters is, is symbolized by this door. So her, her, here's what, he's, what Rachel is, here's what Leah's dealing with. She said, I'm going to name him Judah. He said, because I believe God's going to give me a door out of my addiction. His name is going to be Jesus. And somebody here today, you're worried about who likes you, who cares about you. And I ain't, you ain't by yourself because I'm an addict. He said, listen, here's all I want you to do. He's the, I want you to walk through the door. Yeah. I don't care how much you've messed up, how much you uh, depended upon the approval of others, how much you were, thought it was going to be in your resources, how much you thought it was going to be in your relationships, how connected you are, you thought it was going to be in your recognition, how many people give you thumbs up, how many attaboys, how many pats on the back, how many said, Daddy's proud of you. He said, let me tell you this, that's good, but your ultimate recognition is when you walk through the door, which is Jesus Christ, and God reconciles you to himself. Can I close with this story? You've heard the story of the prodigal son. And the prodigal son, in Luke chapter 15, the boy says to his daddy, he said, daddy, give me my inheritance while you live. He said, I know you ain't going to get, you're supposed to die first, but daddy, I wish you were dead. I don't want no relationship with you. I want to be on my own. Give me my money now. And the father divides unto them his living, both the older son and the younger son. And the younger son went to the far country, the Bible says. What he did, he took his inheritance, went to the, went to the person and exchanged it, made it liquid, made, got him some cash in his pocket. And went on to the far country. He's probably a teenager. 17, 18 years old. Wants to be out on his own. Want to live foot loose and fancy free. I'm tired of being up under my daddy's rules and regulations. And he, he, he leaves, finds himself in the far country. And when he was in the far country, he having a good time, y'all. He got plenty of money in his pocket. He go in the club buying everybody drink. He going and treating everybody, living in the best of places. But how many of you know money runs out? And as money ran out, the Bible says there was a famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And here's what happens. He said he ain't got no money now. And the Bible says he finds himself in the hog pen, and the text says, and no one gave unto him. Everybody he was buying drinks for, they gone now. Everybody he saw at the club when he was making it rain, all them gone. When he's doing all the stuff with his friends, all them gone. See the problem if you try to get approval from folks? When you really need them, they gone. He, he finds himself in the hog pen, eating thing, and he comes to himself. He said, you know what? I'm going to go home to daddy. He said, I'm going to go home to daddy. Watch this. He said, I'm going to make him, I'm going to ask him to just make me a slave, a day laborer. I can come work off my little money and go home. So he rises up from the pig pen. Starts making his way back to his father's house. And while he's making his way back to his father's house, watch this. The 
father sees them afar off. What's it got to do with reconciliation? Because this boy done tore his britches. That's all y'all, y'all, that's old folk know that. This boy done tore his britches. It's because you don't disrespect daddy like that. You don't wish your daddy be dead so you can get his money. You don't talk to crazy to your daddy like that. And then he leaves. And watch this. When he turns his money, turns his land into money, can you imagine the people in the village? Can you believe that boy did that boy like that? His daddy like that? If that was my son, he'd be getting up off the floor. <laughs> so you can, feed this, you can see this story from many different angles. You can see it from the angle of the younger son and how you waste your substance. You can also see it from the perspective of the older brother that's mad when his brother comes home. Or you can look at it from the perspective of the father. Uh-huh. And let me tell you how this is about reconciliation. Yeah. He done tore his britches. He done messed up. And look what he does. The father, father sees him afar off. And he does what no Jew, Jewish elder man ever did. He ran to meet him. So you didn't do that as a Jewish elder man. You didn't run to meet nobody, especially somebody that did you the way that they did you. Here it does. He kisses him, embraces him, tells his slaves, I want you to slaughter the fatted calf because my son, which was dead, is now alive. He puts his arm around his son walks the son back into the community at the sneers and the jeers of the community. People that didn't want his son to be around. People that say, I wouldn't do that if I were you. You know what son God does? As a father, he puts his hand around his son. And he walks his son in. See, because the ultimate approval is not the community. The ultimate approval is not what folks say about you. The ultimate approval is God. You know what God says? You're not going to be a slave. You're going to be my son. You ain't got nothing on your feet. Bring him some sandals. Slaves don't wear shoes. Sons do. Bring him the robe. And put it on his even his dirty body. Slaves don't wear robes. Sons do. He said, give him my ring with the sign of my authority. Slaves don't wear rings. Sons do. And I came to talk to somebody. He said, you want to be reconciled? Here's the thing. God right now is saying, I want to put my arm around you. I know you messed up. And I know people in the community going to have a problem with you. Watch this. Even your older brother, when he comes home, he gets mad. And listen very carefully. I'm done when I tell you this. Just like the father to meet the younger son that wasted his substance, the father also goes out to meet the self-righteous elder brother. So come on in and celebrate. And the elder brother would not come in. And can I tell you, even in the community of God, there's some elder brothers and you're going to try to get their approval. The only approval that matters is the approval of the Father.